So thank you very much, Atem. Um, this talk is obviously not about me, <laughs> because I am way too young to have 35 years <laughs> of critical analysis behind me. Uh, let's hope this will not never happen to me. But uh, of course, this talk is about uh, Frank's work. It's about opening, you know, the Frank mail file. Try to see what's in there and try to answer the question that Yvon asked me, which is what did Frank Mail really do in <laughs> this last <laughs> 35 years, right? And I'd certainly like to thank Yvon, Atem and Thomas for you know, sharing some insight on their beautiful works so that I could prepare for this. Okay, so Frank Mail is, of course, an Ecole Normale student, I mean, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Which good mathematician isn't, right? So he enters Ecole Normale in 82, and he gets out of it uh, in 87 with a PhD that he did under the supervision of Henri Beristiki. And then what you see is what used to be the typical French career. Um, you know, you enter CNRS, you go abroad a few years, just to double check that your initial intuition was correct. That is that there is only one place in the world where you can do decently mathematics, which is of course Paris. <laughs> and so he comes back very quickly. But of course in Paris, you know, there are big centers of mathematics. You can be, you know, a prince in one of these centers, but you would be a prince among the princes, you know, fighting to sit at the table of the king. Or you can go slightly further away and you know, claim ownership you know, on a smaller fortress, but this is, this is for you to build it, right? And this is exactly what happened in 91 when Franck um, became a professor at Sergi Pontoise. There was a very small group there, and you know, with a group of people, actually an outstanding group of people, Emmanuel Lebé is over there, Franck and some other build an amazing group, and you know, I've seen quite a lot of French departments, very good ones, very bad ones. And I can tell you that when you see what this department in Sergi looks like nowadays, you know, they can be very proud. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing place. But of course, men in their 40s are men in their 40s. And you know, when beautiful ladies like the University of Chicago or IHES knock at your door, you know, it's, it's hard to say no. So since then, you can uh, see Franck uh, of course, in Sergi ICS, where he has this night chair, and of course, from time to time in Chicago, and we know who he visits in Chicago. So, Franck has had a, a, um, a number of prizes in his career. Started in 97, theoretical physics prize from uh, Institut Henri Poincaré. Um, he's been a section speaker at ICM in 1998. 2014, he's a plenary speaker uh, in Seoul. And then he got uh, recognized twice by the French Academy, by, in 2000, Richard Louis de Sauce de Fresinet, uh, the prestigious Prix Ampère in 2018. Uh, in 2005, he gets the silver medal uh, uh, of CNRS, and the American Mathematical Society gave him twice the Boucher Prize in 2005 and 2000, 2023, and recently uh, the Clay Research Award. So that's a beautiful uh, series of prizes. So, when he finishes in PhD in 87, of course this is PhD under the supervision of Henri Beristiki, this is nonlinear uh, elliptic equations, extraordinarily dynamic field, particularly in the 80s, very strong group in France, and I know that Franck uh, was very much influenced by what he learned there, and, and, and by what pe people did there in particular, the idea that these people really addressed a truly nonlinear problem uh, with all that it means and develop from scratch completely new techniques. But it is the case that soon after a PhD, no matter what, Frank Merz wants to do something else. And in particular, very early on, uh, he starts being interested in, in, in singularity formation problem. And, in it, and typically, you know, he will spend a lot of time focusing on canonical simple models. Typically, these are the, the ones that we're going to, to discuss, heat, wave, and nonlinear Schrodinger equation with the idea that you, know, you put a simple nonlinearity to try uh, and understand things. And you need to remember what the state of the art was 
back uh, uh, in the 80s. Of course, it, 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 there were both many things that had been done, in particular in the 70s, uh, by, by Zakharov. Formal things were understood, uh, but, but rigorously, there were actually uh, little work. Typically, for a model like NLS, little was known on singularity formation, except this kind of virial type argument. That is, you knew that some classes of solutions could not lead to uh, 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 global solutions, but the description of the singularity uh, was very poor. And in some specific cases, and I'll get back to this, typically the heat equation of some instances uh, 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 on the wave equation, when you had you know, some more insight, actually very exciting things were done, but this was very far from being uh, a, a complete uh, picture and many, uh, many open problems, even on these simple uh, um, uh, models, were completely open and not only open, I mean, what you had to do to actually enter uh, uh, the understanding of the singularity formation problem was far from being clear. So Frank will, if I, if I want to look at what's been done, Frank's been really uh, pushing uh, two main routes. And, and one thing that was certainly central uh, uh, in so many aspects of his work is the dynamical classification of exceptional solutions, this idea that in the nonlinear world, you know, there are special solutions, special bubbles of energy that play uh, a, a, a distinguished role. And of course, in some sense, of course, they are in some sense the attractor of of the floor, there are exceptional elements, and you need to understand them. You need to classify them. You need to uh, use uh, 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 undeniable Liouville-type theorem on on this solution, and that's that's something that again will be uh, uh, fu fundamental uh, uh, all, all along his work. And another aspect of this, which is connected, but it depends. So sometimes it's really directly co connected. Some sometimes it's not. Is the question of construction of 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 blue up solution? You know, understand. Uh, you know, in in setting where you don't understand things, where you have very few examples, you know, try to put your hands uh, on example. Try to understand what are the scenario, what are uh, uh, the the mechanism. At least produce example, and maybe in the long run obtain classification results, show that whatever you proved uh, existed uh, uh, is something universal, but you know, this, is, this, is, this would be a second step. And, and all along, in, in, in both these approaches, really, uh, uh, this is always this thinking of, you know, this is always about addressing nonlinear non problem, a very strong influence from um, uh, elliptic and parabolic world and try to derive uh, 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 mon monotonicity formula, and of course something that is absolutely central um, in his works is the notion of critical and sup supercritical problems, which you know again <coughs> nowadays are of course very natural, but maybe where if you look back, we are maybe not so obvious. So let me tell you uh, a few words of Franck's on minimal bubble. So certainly. One problem he was very much aware at the end of his PhD uh, is the critical NLS. So typically, I wrote the, the, the PDE down there. So this is the cubic fo focusing <coughs> NLS. So this is the L2 critical problem. And something that people had done at the beginning of the 80s is understand uh, actually a very beautiful picture, which is that small data solutions just behave linearly. But there is a first solution, it's the soliton, uh, uh, which is a solution to a nonlinearity equation, and this guy behaves di dif dif differently. It does not scatter, it does not behave as at the linear wave, and in fact, in some sense, it, it defines exactly the threshold uh, uh, for scattering and global existence in the sense that at the minimal level, that is at the L2, uh, um, at the mass of the ground state level, there is another guy, there is someone else, which is a pseudo conformal transformation of the ground state, and it blows up in finite time. Okay, so this is really a picture that was understood rather uh, um, uh, early on, but then in 86, uh, this beautiful paper by Lenman Papa Nicolaou Sulem Sulem, who this is numerical and, and some sort of formal analysis as well, who tell you, well, I mean, we, okay, there is this explicit blue up solution. That's one of the very few examples that we have, which is explicit where you have singularity formation. It has a blue up speed, which I, this is this lambda of t, which I write there, it's t minus t, but this is not what we see neither in a computer and nor for, uh, for heuristic reasons. We think that the generic blue up speed is something very different, it's a so-called log, log log law. And you know, back then there was some controversy on whether this should be actually uh, the, the correct picture in here. But this is, you know, this is typically a problem that uh, uh, Frank was, was very much aware of and wanted to start working on. So clearly the first uh, 
one of the you know, very well-known celebrated theorem by Franck is this result uh, back in 92, which is the following thing. It tells you that the ground state is the first, um, is, the, is the unique minimal mass blue-up solution. So if you are you know, in the natural energy class, if you have L2 mass equal to the ground state, if you blow up in finite time, well, up to symmetries. That's exactly S of T, that is, that's the pseudo conformal transformation of the ground state. And you understand that what you're seeing here is, in fact, uh, uh, one of the first dynamical classi um, characterization of the solitary wave. It's telling you Q, the ground state, is the, only is the only solution as a solution to the nonlinear PDE that satisfies this and this. And in this sense, uh, here it's exactly the first. Um, uh, this is in radio symmetry, right? In uh, maybe in 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 you have two papers, but the second one was not. Well, uh, if you there were two steps, no. Well, yeah, there are iterations a bit, of course, but uh, <laughs> you know. So let's let's see. Let's just take a look at how you know how how how, how do you prove some something like that? How do you show? that actually, how do you characterize uh, uh, the ground state as being the uh, unique uh, minimal mass blow-up solution? So what you do is you look at your flow, you look your, at your solution uh, uh, U, you look at the sequence of time that goes to the blow-up time, and of course this is suppose you have a finite time blow-up solution, it's blowing up, so the first thing you want to do is you want to renormalize, okay? You renormalize it to be of size one, and you realize using the scaling variance of the equation that when you do that, you will keep your H1 norm under control, L2 norm will not move, but this will crush the natural uh, conservation law of the problem, that is, it will let energy go to zero. Okay? So then you find yourself with a bounded sequence in H1, and then you use, in the modern language, uh, uh, concentration compactness à, à la Lyon, so profile decomposition uh, à la Patrick Gérard, that is, you say, well, any such bounded sequence in H1, in fact, I can decompose it as a sum of decoupled bubbles plus an error that I can make as small as I want. Okay, and the point is the following thing. The point is that because you're minimal, there can be only one bubble. Okay, simply because if there were two bubbles, if there were two Vj, then because the total mass of Un is essentially the total mass of the, of the Vj, if there are two of them, then both of them need to have mass strictly less than the ground state, but then this is strictly positive energy, but this contradicts the fact that the energy is going to uh, zero. Okay, so there can be only one bubble, and in fact, what you can show from there is that it's automatic that your solution is L2 compact, that is your minimal uh, solution up to translation uh, is compact uh, uh, in the L2 space, that is you can write U as being up to rescaling and, and translation. It has some limit as T goes to T, and actually the limit in this case is identified. It's Q, okay? So this is really what you see, this is the notion of being compact uh, uh, in the critical space. But, there is something very unpleasant here. This argument will not tell you anything about this, uh, the point of concentration x of t and the speed lambda of t at which things occur. And then there's, there's something actually, there's been several iterates on, 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 on how to do that and, and uh, other contributions. And, but the idea is exactly this. This is, this. this is the key. What you want to do is use this compactness in L2 to, it allows you to localize conservation law, understand how mass evolves, and the key now is to use the fact that you can integrate from the singularity. That is, you know, the fact that you, are a, that you concentrate in L2, that you are L2 compact, sim simply means that your, that your solution, if you want, up to translation, is going to form a direct mass, you know, say in X2, say as T goes to T, up to translation, you need to know what translation does. So it simply means that all the mass concentrate at the origin. So when you integrate, actually, from the, the blow-up point, what you can show is that you can gain regularity. You see, this is the opposite of a Cauchy problem, you know, a dispersive Cauchy problem. You propagate whatever you put in the data. What is being said here is that you using the compactness in the L2 space, you can integrate from the point of singularity, gain regularity, understand that some quantity is going to go to zero. And in fact, this quantity is related to another conservation law of the flow. So you understand that eventually, up to symmetries, in fact, your solution, thanks to this property here, had zero energy. But at minimal level, there is only one guy that has zero energy. And L2 mass equal to the one of the ground state is the ground state itself. OK, so the, 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 the argument is very clear. L2 compactness, integrate from the singularity, gain regularity, use conservation law to obtain another information, which completely locks the system. 
Okay. So this is very nice. I mean, this is this is first the, uh, dynamical characterization of the solid arrays, but this proof has a serious problem. The problem is that mm. this is something that leaves only, this is an information, this is something that's been done only at the minimal mass level. Right? There is no dynamical information in this proof about what lambda of t does, about x of t does. There is no such computation. It's really all about, you know, it's like walking, uh, you know, on the edge of a cliff, you can find your way, you don't fall, but in some sense, you know, y you cannot take this mm -hmm. and think that you're going to understand the, the, the mass supercritical problem or, you know, this is really something very specific. So in some sense, this proof, uh, you know, has been some sort of a singularity for a very long time and it took 15 years to understand, to see this proof again. Uh, in the Kenning Merle route map. So this is this is this is this is a long story. This is actually an amazing story. So this is uh, typically started uh, uh, with this work of Jenny Brenvelo on scattering for the, for for the defocusing model, the defocusing NLS, which in a brief work by Bourguin was propagated to the energy critical case. So Bourguin could show that at the energy critical level for 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 the defocusing model, he could use an induction argument to show that every solution. Uh, we lead to scattering. So what uh, uh, Carlos Kenning and Frank Merle did um, in their inversion S paper back in 2006 is they exactly extended the L2 critical setting to the sharp global existence of scattering setting to the energy critical focusing problem and essentially the statement that you will see typically uh, in, in, in dimension three, so this would be radial data, is that if the energy is less in the energy of Q and, and you have these constraints uh, on, on the altitude of the gradient, then solutions scatter and this is completely sharp. Again, what I want to do is just show you very briefly, how do you prove that? Well, of course, there is a deep connection with the minimal mass theorem. So stray cats will tell you that if your energy is small, then all solutions are global. So you argue by contradiction and you say, so there has to be, uh, suppose that the minimal level of energy below which there is catching, you argue by contradiction and you say that it does not satisfy the condition that it's less, uh, you, you said it's strictly less than the energy of the ground state. Then you will use some sort, then of course what you want to do is take a sequence of initial data, use your n that will converge such that the energy converges to the critical value and what you want to do in some sense is extract some compactness which is typically in the elliptic setting the analog you know, of, of, of the convergence of polysmal se sequences. So now you need to do some concentration uh, uh, type compactness argument and this is again a very beautiful uh, story with major contribution by Bauer et Gérard, beautiful paper in the L2 critical case by Merle and Vega and here I'm quoting the Kerani paper back in 2001 where this is done so you decompose your set of initial data in a bunch of, of, of bubbles. So you have this profile ULG plus an arbitrary error. And of course, this is no longer about Sobolev embedding of H1 and 2 L2. This is about uh, loss of compactness of stray cast estimates. OK, and then the argument is exactly conceptually similar to the one in the L2 critical. So what you will say is the following words. These profiles UGL, there can be just one of them. Because if there were more, each of them will have energy strictly less than the minimal energy that will lead to scattering. So each of them will lead to scattering solution, but two scattering solutions that separate is still a, a scattering solution. So this cannot do, this contradicts the minimality of EC. Okay, so I mean, of course this is, need to, you know, make this crystal clear, but this is exactly what's going on at the end of the day. At the end of the day, what you extract from this sequence is the existence of a minimal element, there is a minimal solution that has critical energy and which is compact up to, to the symmetries of the flow. Okay, and what you have to do now, you have to say, but well, let's imagine that the energy of this guy is strictly below the, the, uh, the energy of the ground state, and then you use the compactness in the critical space to localize your conservation law, in particular conservation of mass. So you have there, there are several regimes that you need to do, but for example, one of them is that you need to rule out some sort of singularity formation. And then you will integrate, you will gain regularity, in this case it's, it's L2, you will use your conservation law in L2 and you will immediately get a contradiction. I'm going to say that when I saw this proof, you know, 15 years after the L2 critical proof, I mean, this was, you know, this, this was actually amazing. It's, it's an amazing proof. And again, you know nothing about lambda of t, you know nothing about x of t. This is something that it's, it's all the, 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 the compactness property is enough to actually get your answer. 
So, but of course, these guys were only started, so um, Carlos gave us a beautiful lecture and an update on, on the Soliton re resolution program. These works, um, so this was not, it's not on the, uh, so there's some, so some work on NLS, but it's really on the wave, on the energy critical focusing wave equation that an absolutely uh, stunning picture has been given. And the fact that, so typically I'm quoting the paper um, back in 2014. So for the radial wave in 3D, you have a complete uh, uh, um, resolution soliton uh, resolution decomposition of the solution. Every global solution of the equations decomposed as a finite term, uh, as a finite sum of solitons up to scaling uh, plus a remainder which is uh, uh, given by pure radiation. Of course, this has triggered, you know, uh, this is just the beginning of the story. The point I would like to make is that there was no, there was no plan to do that. I mean, some things like this were known in the parabolic setting when some sort of dis uh, you know, dissipation mechanism were clear, but the plan to attack uh, uh, this kind of thing uh, was very unclear, and it's connected to, to other works of Franck, uh, which I will mention. And of course, at the heart of the proof um, is, again, this idea of dynamic classification of the solitary wave, that is, understand how do you realize, how do you um, uh, characterize the explicit objects that are supposed to be the only non-linear non objects, so I, call, I systematically call it Q. How do you characterize this Q? Why is this Q, uh, uh, um, uh, so why is, is this the only kind of object that you can see when you look at the long time asymptotics of the, of the solution? And it's really related, at least in dimension three, and Carlos explained that the picture is more complicated, but this is certainly, the way the, w the way things started, this is this is this kind of Liouville theorem of classifications, which tell you that solutions that do not want to eject energy, solutions that do not want to to disperse, well, there is essentially only zero uh, of, the, of the ground state. This is an amazing proof, and 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 really, this is this the, the very beautiful thing in this proof is that the way you show that U is actually exactly the ground state is you capture the ground state by, by its tail. You start doing this far away where everything is linear, then, and then you start understanding slowly how to extract information from there. You first understand that only the tail of solution can sort of be the enemy in the linear setting, and then you, you, know, you have also, and then you, you, you work harder and you understand that only Q as a solution of the elliptic problem uh, ca can be your non-dispersive solution. Okay, so let me tell you of course, this story is not chronological. Let me go back, you know, the years 90, 91, 92, Frank has done his minimal mass <coughs> theorem. But as I told you, the minimal mass theorem for NLS is really something, you know, this proof is very specific, it's very fragile, and he could not use this. I, he tried, I mean, there are, there's a very interesting, uh, um, 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 prepublication. Uh, this, uh, this was back in, uh, it's a pre yeah. Well, when this was back in the day, there was no archive and, 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 you know, things could circulate and etc. Where you see Franck trying to use this kind of ideas to, to, to go dynamically in, into the problem. But so, well, the NLS problem was in some sense stuck and Franck uh, uh, got interested in something else. He got interested in, uh, in the Zakharov equation. So Zakharov equation, cubic, uh, 2D, this is, this is a very famous model from, from plasma physics. It's a complicated model. Uh, it's really something you couple your nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, to, you know, to, to um, a nonlinear wave equation. Uh, the coupling is complicated. Local, theory, local Cauchy theory back then was, was, was unclear. And, you know, in some sense, it's unusual uh, for Franck. You know, Franck's like simple models, but he couldn't do the simple model, so all of a sudden he you know, he attacks something which is substantially, in some sense, um, more complicated. And then you have this, this series of two papers, so Viriel uh, blew up for Zakharov and, uh, and the scaling lower bound. So the, there is something you should know about Zakharov, the difference between Zakharov and NLS. Of course, if I take, uh, if I send a light speed to infinity, if C0 is plus infinity, I'm back to NLS. But this equation has no scaling, okay? There are two scalings that could compete in principle, the one of NLS and the one of the wave. And what is being said in this paper is that it's the wave scaling that, that works. 
And, and, and in particular, what's proved there is that singularity formation will form for this system, which is completely unknown. The argument is a virial type argument, but, but it's a complicated one. The obvious things don't work. And there is something very, uh, very nice going on, in particular, uh, in the virial group for, for Zakharov. I mean, if you read this paper, you will see that this front male is the one that was described by his advisor, Henri Beristiki, uh, last time. That is the machine that could you know, do any sort of computation, uh, <laughs> do 20 pages of computation just like this, day after day. And this is what you will find uh, in this paper. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, lots of computation there. And then there is this beautiful uh, series of papers with uh, Leo Glanchta, where Frank, uh, it's, it's, it's Frank sh and, 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 and Glanchta showed some, something amazing. They showed that you know, the correct uh, a, a candidate for blow profile for, for singularity for formation here, so again, has nothing to do in this case with the log log low. Of course, the wave wins in some sense, but the structure of the profile is given in some sense by a deformation of the pseudo conformal transformation. That is what he's telling you. If I go back uh, 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 to this picture here, he's telling you that the kind of singularity formation that you should expect for, uh, for NLS is really given by some sort of deformation uh, of this kind of profile. And at the end of the day, what, what uh, it amounts doing, it amounts uh, sorry, it amounts constructing uh, a solution uh, to a nonlinear elliptic equation, which in some sense bifurcate from the ground state. And this is something, you know, there were things like this in the literature, you know, trying to compute self similar solution or trying to compute broad profiles, but sort of by a bifurcation method. And it's very well known, and this is something we bump into later, that in some sense, this kind of bifurcation is singular. There is something wrong. I mean, this, you cannot be, uh, there, there, there is a problem of function space. Things don't decay well, it's a disaster. But it's not the case in this paper, actually. There is a miracle uh, which makes things actually nice. Things decay nicely. And uh, in some sense, I call it being very lucky. But Frank has a different name for it. He calls it intuition. But, but, you know, and th 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 there is a miracle here. OK, but, you know, the Zakharov, it's very nice, but this is still not, you know, in some sense, this is, again, a singularity formation uh, uh, by the argument. And, and OK, so some explicit solutions are constructed here. But, you know, understanding the flow completely, in particular, uh, ar around the solitary wave is, 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 is still an open problem as of today. Is something that Franck could not do. So he decided, I suppose, at some point uh, in the middle of the 90s, you know, to, to in some sense, you know, try to go back to problems that were a little bit better understood. And in particular, uh, uh, there was this beautiful series of work uh, uh, by Giga and Cohen on, on, on the nonlinear heat equation. So give, if I give you a crash, course on singularity formation for the heat equation, really what Giga and Code did is they tell you, well, if you, if you renormalize the flow, if you have a singularity somewhere and, and you zoom near the singularity, though you will have your renormalized flow, which is the solution to this equation here. And what Giga and Cohen proved is that uh, there is a beautiful uh, mon monotonicity formula uh, 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 for this flow. And it's something that it looks like the, the standard energy, if you want, for the nonlinear problem. But there is something absolutely fundamental here. There is a weight. Okay? And it, wha wha what it means is that these weights, these quantities, are really seeing what's happening locally around, uh, around the, the singularity. And this is really the starting point uh, um, of the giga cone analysis. You know, the idea very uh, roughly is to say, well, I have some quantity that decay, so you have a functional. My renormalized time S is a global time because, because it's, it's, it's um, a consequence of, of the normalization. And so in some sense, if you can control that, well, this means that you control space-time integral of this. So this means that DSV needs to go to zero in some sense. This means that the attractors of the flow essentially are the stationary solution to this equation. And what you can show is that in some range of the exponent, actually, there is only one uh, 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 stationary solution to this uh, uh, equation. It's given by a constant. Okay, so this is exactly, this is exactly. Sorry, this is exactly what they will tell you here. They will tell you that in some range, um, there is only um, 
uh, some range of parameter p, there is only one uh, uh, self-similar solution, which is the universal attractor of the flow, and that's just the constant. So in a series of work um, with a student, uh, Hatem Zag, which from what I understand uh, he stole from his own advisor, but this, this is a different story. Uh, <laughs> They did something. Uh, no, no, it's an exchange. Uh, it's an exchange. I see. This was this was a gentleman agreement. I see. <laughs> but so what they did with Hatem um, is the following thing. You know, they they said, but uh, this profile. I mean, if I zoom on 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 the singularity, so I'm forming a singularity somewhere. But but then I zoom. You know, I look at at what's happening really on the singularity, and I see a constant profile. Right? Because this is what Giga can tell you. They tell you in some local sense, you really can converge to a constant function. But of course, you cannot be a constant function forever. This has, because this is just a zoom. You are, if you are, have finite energy, at some point, you must reconnect to someone nice. Okay? So there is a free boundary in your problem. There is a boundary layer. There is an inner boundary uh, which you need to compute. So it's related to this, to this parameter B here. And this is exactly what's being done uh, in this paper at Duke. They they do two things. They give you a two-line heuristics of uh, why there should be such a profile, uh, you know, how to compute this reconnection. And then they do the, the entire analysis to actually justify the, the fact that, you know, this self-similar solution, this constant kappa, it's really just the first term in, uh, in an expansion. And in fact, this expansion is absolutely fundamental. And this is another class of, of result. In fact, this expansion and this specific profile is deeply linked uh, uh, to the classification of uh, uh, ancient solution and, and parabolic Liouville type theorem that tell you that these functions play a distinguished role uh, in the analysis. And this was later essential, in particular, in uh, regularity uh, theorem of the blue upset uh, uh, obtained later by, uh, uh, by Hatton. Uh, recently, in, in, in a recent work, Frank and Atem uh, 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 went even further than this, and they tell you that even this supposedly simple picture with the profile kappa and this kind of profile is still, I mean, this is still one case. There are many solutions, actually, uh, uh, much more complicated, much more uh, uh, asymmetric that live there and uh, that are still not understood. So and sometimes even the simple problem um, of the nonlinear heat equation is not, um, uh, you know, it's far from being completely un un understood. I will come back uh, 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 to, to, to this expansion and, you, you know, to this structure here. You understand what's going on here. What's being computed is a front, okay? So that after renormalization, your solution wants to draw a kappa, but of course, there is a free boundary. It's a front that invades uh, 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 um, the rest of the solution, and, and you can compare this, uh, um, you know, in original variables. But then, Frank wanted to do, uh, wanted to move away from the parabolic world. He wanted to do the wave equation. So of course, in principle, you know, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is completely different. And the way this program started is with joint work with a, with a student of Frank, Antonini. And, and the way it started really is exactly by this, by uh, 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 producing exactly an, uh, a similar functional like um, in the gigacon work. That is the fact that uh, if you renormalize the flow at, 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 at a singularity, that you can cook up a quantity, which, uh, um, which of course, you have no exponential weight anymore. You have, you have some weight here that, in fact, corresponds to the Lycon. And you should think that the weight is singular at y equal 1, but in, in the renormalization here, y is just x divided by t minus t. So this is the wave equation. So y equal 1 is just the Lycon. And you, you find some sort of, of, of you know, related uh, uh, um, monotonicity formula. Uh, so of course, which is, of course, just the starting point of the analysis. So Frank and Atem started. Uh, you know, this is the starting point of the study of singularity formation for the nonlinear wave equation uh, in a series of work by Frank and Atem. And what they did is nothing but completely amazing. What they did, uh, so first of all, 
It's in dimension one. I'll, 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 I'll tell more about this. So in dimension one, if p is below the conformal exponent, what they tell you is they, is they tell you exactly what you want to know. That is, they tell you at a blow-up point, if you renormalize and if you look at what the solution will look like, then asymptotically you will decompose it to a bunch of bubbles. Okay, so this is really a soliton resolution conjecture, if you want. Uh, uh, statement. So this bubble, their correspond, so they are the analog of the kappa constant, except that you have the Lorentz group that acting on, uh, on everybody here. So they really look like uh, um, uh, this kind of guy here, so they, they need to be more uh, dilated. This, this kappa d, the d, they depend on some quantity d, which localizes in your light cone where you are. So any after renormalization, you will uh, uh, be a sum of bubble plus some radiation and, and and, and of course, and then essentially there are two cases. Either you will see only one bubble, which will be nicely li li lying strictly inside your light cone, and this is a non-characteristic point, and I'll explain in a, in a minute what this means. Or, actually, you will see more of them. There are more bubbles, and they will tell you exactly uh, what kind of configurations are possible and what kind of configurations are not possible. And, and they will tell you exactly how this point moves. They will tell you asymptotically, not only do we know that these guys are there, but they explicitly tell you how these points move and how they should do, and it's uh, asymptotically given by a universal uh, 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 TODA system. And in particular, if there are more than one bubble, then some of these guys will want to go to the boundary. They will want to see the boundary uh, 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 of the light cone. And this is related to the fact that, so if this is, um, this is x, if this is t, what you can do is that you can draw the curve t of x corresponding uh, to where uh, 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 the, the singularity occurs. And what you can show, in fact, so there was the question was, can this curve have characteristic points? That is, can this curve be, uh, uh, that there exist points such that, in fact, so first of all, you have to make sense of the fact that this curve is well defined. And then the question is, can you find points where actually, uh, at this point, um, you can exactly, you know, if you take the backwards light cone uh, below this point, then actually it's tangent to the blob curve t, t of x. And this was, you know, these were questions uh, uh, that was raised in the 80s, um, in particular by uh, Kafarelli and Friedman. And what they tell you is the following thing. So the existence of this point uh, uh, was completely unclear. And what they tell you is that Yes, there are such solution. These points are isolated, and essentially away from this point, you will be uh, non-characteristic. So it means that the complete description of uh, uh, the solution after renormalization is directly translated in terms of regularity uh, uh, of the blob curve. And, and of course, and it gives you existence and uh, isolatedness of characteristic points. I mean, this works in this form. I mean, I'm not aware really of you know, problems where you have such a sharp description and uh, you know, it's of course something completely uh, canonical. Uh, this is 1D because at some point in the proof, it's a complete classification theorem, right? And at some point in the proof, you need to say, this is typical in 1D on this kind of problem, you need to say, well, the only, the unique, the only self-similar solution to my equation essentially is the constant modulo this guy. This is known in 1D, it's not known uh, in higher D, and in higher D, what you can, however, do is transform the whole proof into the construction proof and show that there exist indeed such characteristic points. So in some sense, you know, the only thing that's 1D in this picture is um, uh, the classification part. Okay, so this is, of course, I mean, this is, this is not, uh, this is not, you, uh, you understand, this is, this is a program. This is exactly like, I mean, this is, this is an immense amount of work. Uh, uh, which rages from, you know, beginning of the millennium, uh, um, actually till now, with, uh, with, uh, with this kind of thing here. So let me go back to the end of the 90s. And so Frank has done the minimal mass problem at the beginning of the 90s. He's done this Zakharov thing, uh, uh, which is very interesting. He still certainly thinks about the NLS problem, because there are, there are tra traces of that. But something, you know, he's certainly thinking about parabolic problem as well, but there is something, you know, there is something he doesn't understand about this dispersive equation, and then he really wants to put his hand on one of these problems, and in particular, he wants to understand 
you know, mass subcritical problems. That he wants to understand really what happens if you are above the minimal mass uh, 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 for singularity formation. So this is something he could not do yet on NLS. And then he started uh, uh, this program uh, with Yvon Martel on the study uh, of this kind of problem for uh, uh, the KDV, mo mod mod modified KDV, and in particular, I'll mention these works on the uh, uh, cubic uh, KDV, so which is which is the the L2 critical problem. So let me just explain what the problem is. You see, if you have an equation like this, first of all, singularity formation was completely unknown in the sense that uh, numerics were unclear and whether this thing would or would not blow up and how it would blow up was unclear. The only thing that you have in hand, what you know for free, is that if you stay, if you start close to the ground state, right, which is supposed to be the minimal wave, uh, 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 again, in some sense, the, the minimal solution, if you start close to the ground state, what you know, because of the rational characterization of the ground state and because of conservation law, what you know is that up to symmetries, you will stay close to it. Okay? So you have a stability statement, which is in some sense, given for free, you have nothing to do, you just have to stare at your conservation law. But there's a problem. The problem, and this is maybe the major difference with respect to uh, uh, the Giga cone that I mentioned, or these beautiful works by Frank and Atem, the problem is that what's not given to you is the blow-up speed. You have no idea how fast, in principle, it, you have no idea if this guy wants to concentrate, so will lambda goes to zero, and, and, and if it does, you have no idea how to control, actually, the rate at which this thing will, will concentrate. So there is really something is completely blocked. Here. And there was, again, no uh, obvious reason to believe that this thing would um, or would not blow up. So the first uh, work, I mean, one of the, so really the way they addressed this problem, the way they started this problem, uh, is really uh, through this idea of Liouville theorem and classification of minimal elements, classification of solid high wave, and this idea to try to understand when is it that the ground state, um, you know, uh, how can I dynamically characterize uh, the ground state? What kind of solutions, uh, what kind of properties do I need to assume on you so that the only solution actually is the ground state? And typically, one of these first statements uh, um, is, what, is what you see here. Uh, the, the fact that essentially, if you remain of size one and you don't eject energy, that is your, your L2 titan time, then you need to be the ground state. This is exactly, you know, this is in some sense the, the mass supercritical characterization of the ground state that starts here. So let me say that uh, uh, um, this program really uh, the kind of thing that has been done to address this kind of question uh, was completely uh, has been turned out to be extraordinarily influential uh, both in Frank's work but in many other, other works. In particular uh, uh, the way modulation equations are computed that is the way finite dimensional uh, dynamic of lambda and finite di dimensional uh, uh, and infinite dimensional dynamic for, for the remainder epsilon are coupled. And the way you can actually put your hand in the understanding of the, the, of the dynamics are, are really, you know, in some sense it's completely elementary, and, but it's, it's extraordinarily robust. And, and the kind of things that have been done there to uh, uh, attack the, the problem, you know, uh, this is something, uh, all that comes after is nothing but a development of what started in there. And in particular, there's this beautiful set of ideas, this idea that, you know, you can, you can produce suitable, you know, Moravec type identity with, with suitable multiplier. You know, if you're clever enough in your choice of multiplier, you can really uh, produce mon mon monotonicity formulas that will turn out to be fundamental uh, uh, in the control of the evolution. So a spectacular consequence of the Liouville theorem is the fact that you can so say that you could show singularity formation for the generalized K KDV equation. That is, show that if the data is strictly has energy is strictly negative and you start close to uh, to the ground state, say uh, in in L two and you're in your H one, then you have finite or infinite time blow up, and the proof is really. Uh, again, in the same state of mind of extraction in a way or another of you know, some uh, 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 special uh, uh, solution. That is, you assume it's not true. This is something, you know, if you work with Frank, you want to prove anything, the proof starts by contradiction because this is, there's, you know, whatever you want to prove, it starts with the contradiction. So let's assume it's not true. 
then if it's not true, then actually what you will do is you will follow the ground state. So there is a weakness, and they knew this very well, there is a weakness with the KDV problem, which is that the, the solitary wave travels to the right, but dispersion is ejected because of the array function. It wants to go on the left. Okay? So in some sense, if you follow your ground state, what you will see, and you use the kind of monotonicity formula that was uh, 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 dis discovered there, what you will see that you can actually follow your, uh, your ground state, and if you don't blow up, you can extract a limit object. And because radiation is really gone to the left, what will happen to uh, uh, your limit object is that it will have a flow which is compact, and actually it's better than that. You can really get exponential decay, uniform in time exponential decay of the solution. But if you can do that, what happens is that all of a sudden, well, but epsilon is very nice and epsilon is in L1. But if you're in L1, again, you can use another cons conservation law because with respect to NLS, there is another conservation law, simply the L1 norm. So it's not the norm, it's just the integral of U. And this, this guy uh, you know, does C scaling. So the fact that you have this uniform bound allows you to use another conservation law, which is, does not live at, at the critical level. And this conservation law will force your scaling parameter to remain of size 1. But then if you're L2 tight and you're of size 1, then you enter the regime of the Liouville theorem of Martel and Mayer, and you must have, this means that you're the ground state. But the ground state has zero energy. You assume that you have strictly negative energy. That's your contradiction. OK, so again, monotonicity, you extract, you pass to the limit, you gain regularity, you use conservation law, you get your contradiction. OK? And, and this, was, uh, 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 this was, of course, an immense breakthrough, because this is really, uh, this was actually completely unknown. So right after that, uh, 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 of course, uh, this theorem, as it stands, is completely sharp. Uh, there is nothing, you know, 22 years after, there is nothing to change here. There's been an example uh, uh, of finite and infinite time blow up. So you know, this, is, this is completely sharp. What Franck uh, and Yvon understood soon after is that, uh, 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 in fact, if you assume more, a bit more on the data, and typically because of this asymmetry of the flow for KDV, you would want to assume some sort of decay on the right, then in fact you will, you will recover the fact that uh, uh, you can be more precise. You can show finite time singularity, and you can show uh, uh, a first upper bound on the blow-up rate, which is, um, uh, which is here. So it's the first information on what the, on what the blow-up rate sh should be. So you know, just to share. Uh, you know, I've seen the birth of this theorem, and I started my PhD with Frank in, in 2001, and after two months, he was invited. Apparently, you spend your day at IAS, Frank. I mean, uh, everybody uh, <laughs> is... If, so, uh, again, so you were invited by Bourguin at IAS, and we were going there with, uh, with Yvon. And I was just a PhD student, so what we would do is we would have this office in the wood. I don't know why we were in some remote office in the wood, and what we would do you know, it would be the three of us. We had, you know, huge office. So these two guys, they would spend the day working like dogs, you know, writing estimates, laughing, chatting, writing on the board. I mean, you know, they were super excited. I mean, and what come out of it is this thing. Uh, it's, I love this paper, but it's a double contradiction argument. I mean, it's, you know, at some point you have to stop. It's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing work, but, you know, it's complicated. And, of course, I was starting my PhD. I was working very hard too, you know, trying to find my way to do something, but I, you know, I was not doing anything. And you know, I was furious to see these two guys work all day and you know, do good things, and I was working too, but you know, nothing came out of it. So, you know, the, the, well, that's, uh, that's math. Anyway, so later, and it took some time, you know, of course, and you know, once things get started, then you can, you can think of them, but you know, quite, some, quite later, uh, I was fortunate to, 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 to join them to actually uh, revisit again uh, uh, the KDV analysis because some things were, were slightly better understood. And actually we understood that if we really restrict more the set uh, uh, of initial data near the ground state, then we can have a complete classification theorem. We can completely understand the flow near the ground state and understand how the soliton is a threshold regime which separates between a regime where you will leave a neighborhood of the solitary wave and a regime where actually uh, you can show singularity formation with a prescribed and universal blow up rate, which is given by actually 
the T minus T law, and, and, and several thoughts came out of it, the existence and uniqueness of the minimal blast probe solution, which was completely unknown, and also the fact that in fact, and this is, this is something very important, the, in fact, the coupling between radiation and the wave can produce arbitrary blow-up speed, which is something uh, uh, that, that was uh, com completely unexpected. Uh, another fruit of the KDV analysis because of the way, you see, the point is that really this is, this is, this is all about the coupling between uh, a finite dimensional and infinite dimensional dynamic. Another fruit of this was to understand uh, 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 for the NLS problem, uh, 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 this, uh, this log-log dynamic. There was, of course, uh, a spectacular work by Galina Perenman uh, uh, at the beginning of the, of the millennium, who was the first one to really uh, understand uh, uh, this kind of coupling mechanism and why this log-log law uh, could be made rigorous for the NLS problem. And she used very heavily uh, 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 spectral methods, which, you know, this is actually this was very interesting words and which has connection uh, until today. Uh, the approach uh, that we had with Franck was very much more related to, um, to the NLS ap approach, and in particular allowed us to prove in 2D that the, you know, you know, the virial set is a full set uh, 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 of log-log blow-up, and this was, you know, sort after the KDV problem, sort of a success uh, of the relevance of, of, this me me of this method. And then later, of course, uh, uh, this is really a uh, uh, mass critical problem, you know, of course this has created some, uh, uh, um, uh, some emulation, there's been absolutely beautiful work in other settings, and in particular there's been beautiful work uh, uh, which I'm mentioning here about the energy critical problem, and then this idea started emerging that, you know, L2 critical, energy critical, they are different, but maybe they are not that different actually, and, and really the seed that has been planted here allowed us, uh, ten years later, jointly with, uh, with Frank and Igor Runyansky to get the blow-up for the Schrödinger map, which is typically, uh, you know, some energy-critical analog, uh, 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 really, of the L2 critical model that, that is here. Of course, it took time you know, to do new things, but at the end of the day, you know, it all started uh, with the KDV program. Another spectacular fruit of the KDV program uh, 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 is the collision of soliton program. So, you see, uh, if you start understanding uh, uh, the coupling between you know, speed, translation, and the infinite dimensional of the dynamic, then you can start asking very interesting questions about dynamics of nonlinear solution, in particular dynamics of multi-solitary waves. There is a very uh, beautiful pioneering work by Franck on the construction of multi-solitary wa uh, multi wave for, for L2 critical analysis that was uh, uh, very influential, and then the construction of multi-solitons. Uh, uh, the uniqueness for KDV of multisoliton was done by Yvon, uh, uh, you know, after, after this, this KDV works, and there really is a series of work later about the existence and stability uh, uh, of this multisolitary wave. And then Yvon and, and Franck uh, uh, ask a very difficult problem. They ask, okay, so maybe I have multisolitary waves, but what about interactions of, of multisolitary waves? What happens? If, 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 you know, if two solitary waves, so maybe they want to collide, or maybe they want to stay close to one another, they, you know, you, how can we understand the interaction of solitary waves? And of course, if you are in an integrable setting, as you know very well, this kind of object can be computed explicitly, and typically what people tell you is that in integrable cases, um, um, collisions are elastic, which means that if you're pure soliton at infinity, when you collide, you're still pure at minus infinity. In some sense, they don't see each other. They see each other only through the finite, finite dimensional dynamic. They cannot create infinite dimensional radiations. And in a series of, again, uh, uh, pioneering work, uh, um, by Frank and Yvon, so in uh, particular in the case uh, of the modified, so this is the modified KDV equation and the critical wave equation, they typically do explicitly this kind of computation, so nobody knows how to do uh, two big solitons, you know, unless you cheat with the speed. I mean, uh, if they are both big and the interaction is big, nobody knows how to, how to do that. So in some sense, you need some perturbative setting, which, which depends on which paper you're looking at. But the idea is that what is being done here is, is a program for the complete computation of the interaction of the solitary wave, the complete computation of the coupling between the finite and the infinite dimensional dynamics, and the understanding that uh, uh, in non-integrable uh, settings, the collision is not elastic. There will be uh, dispersion, and this is something in particular uh, uh, relevant for uh, the solitary resolution um, program, as uh, Carlos mentioned the other day. 
OK, and then a third, maybe, uh, third series of work uh, is about energy su supercritical models. So uh, there is in particular, so in the energy supercritical world, so this is really most of what I talked about here is really about critical problems, be it for the mass of, or the energy. But of course, the world has many fascinating um, supercritical problems. And the first, and, and this is of course, uh, in some sense, slightly dif different world. There, there are more monsters there. And there are, in particular, if you remember what I told you about uh, uh, giga cone theory, they tell you that up to renormalization, where after you zoom in, there is only one attractor, uh, which is given by the constant uh, uh, self-similar solution. Well, this certainly ceases to be true, a priori, if you become energy supercritical. And there are new, you know, there are new asymptotic candidates to be a profile. In particular, there are singular ones. OK, and if you know, you know, there are, it may look like, a, you know, this guy may look like a funny guy, but it's not. I mean, these guys, they are in many, many, many problems, much more problems than you would think. And the idea that some homogeneous solution is an absolutely fundamental object and that, you know, it triggers a lot of nonlinear dynamics is something that is present uh, uh, in many problems. And Herrero and Velasquez were the first one uh, uh, in, this, in this unpublished work of 94 to discover type 2 blow up. That is the fact that indeed, in some regime in the energy supercritical world, there are other type of singularities than the, y than the ones described by, G by Giga and Cohen, and really they rely in particular on the fact that this guy is the picture. So there are three in a series of work uh, with Hiroshima Tano. Uh, they, they, they really address the question of exactly this. What, what should you see after renormalization for the energy critical heat equation for, for in the supercritical range? What does the singularity uh, uh, look like? What you should you see uh, after renormalization? How is the asymptotic profile related to the rate of blow up? And also how this whole picture is related to continuation problem after the singularity, which are very classical problems uh, uh, um, in, the, in the parabolic se setting. So there are many, you know, th this series of paper is a roadmap for supercritical analysis. There are many things in there. I'm just mentioning two of them, uh, um, two results. One tells you that if the nonlinearity is supercritical but not too big, well, in fact, there will not be this kind of type two singularities. They will not be there. They can rule them out, and 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 this is this is something that 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 you need to understand. But if you are sufficiently above, then in fact, indeed, such solution will exist, and they can be attained in some sense as threshold di dynamics, that is, you can construct this guy by sitting on the threshold uh, of, two, uh, uh, sta of, of two stable sets. And again, what's, what's, what's really here uh, um, is really a plan uh, for, for, um, uh, you know, for the study of supercritical e e equation. This is very parabolic in the sense that the maximal principle is used uh, uh, in, va in various instances here, but, but it's likely that many of these results have you know a dispersive counterpart, and then the question of constructing uh, a, a supercritical uh, bubble in in the energy sup supercritical case, you know, after after the L two critical case, after the energy critical case, the question was exactly this one: Can we actually propagate this kind of construction uh, 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 to to higher uh, you know to, to the energy supercritical setting? And you know, just just. A little bit careful here. The big difference is that solitons, which are typically your, your favorite bubble of energy, they have infinite energy here. So you have a tail problem. You need to learn uh, uh, how to handle this. And this is something that along the way and, uh, uh, um, we managed to do in this joint program with, uh, with, uh, with Igor Runyansky. We constructed a, a ty type 2 blow up solution for the focusing analysis. So this is really showing that this beautiful, this mechanism that uh, um, uh, Herrero and Velasquez saw for the heat equation, it is there for, for, for the NLS equation. And in fact, uh, there are also this idea of anisotropic blow up, which is the fact that there are, there are, you know, there are more, there are much more kind of singularities. You don't have to be radially symmetric. You can start understanding truly non-radial blow up, which of course is something relevant if you want to move on uh, to other problems. And finally, I'll mention uh, 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 this series of work, uh, this first series of work uh, rec recently with Frank, where we addressed the question not uh, in the focusing case, but in the defocusing case, right? Which is typically a frontier 
So, of course, in the defocusing case, uh, uh, if you are energy subcritical and subcritical, you will have a global existence at scattering. The critical case is, is essentially Bourguin's result. But, of course, if you go above, can you form singularities or can you not form or, 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 or will there be global existence? Well, this was obviously uh, um, not so clear. And this is really, this is something, I mean, it you know, took us 20 years, but uh, at the end of the day, the, the, the intuition that, that we developed, both for the construction and in some sense to the classification, led us to understand that, well, there are, you know, there are, there are uh, indeed singularity formation uh, uh, is possible for, for the defocusing NLS. And in fact, what you need to understand, you need to make the link uh, with fluid mechanics, in particular explicitly the link uh, with 3D uh, uh, compressible um, equation. And you need to understand, you know, the key the key here, maybe, is the following thing, is that this regime, this kind of regime, it's very easy to, s to show that it does not exist for the heat equation. The heat equation cannot do that. In some sense, it's too simple. It's not the system. It cannot do some, some, something li like this. You really need some system structure, and, and the underlying system structure here is related uh, 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 to the 3D compressible um, to the Freddy compressible Navier-Vinavisoc, and in particular dimension-free, he is essential. The proof of this result is very simple. Well, you need to say two things. Thing number one: in some regimes, I can, you know, typically if I think of uh, if I think on, of Navier-Stokes, in some regimes in 3D, I can throw away dissipation. Dissipation is lower order, so my leading system is Euler, and then I need to uh, to uh, to understand Euler. But then, how do you go? from uh, Navier-Stokes to Euler, if you want to, how do you get into understanding this kind of thing? Well, in fact, you need to understand that what you're facing is a front re renormalization problem. What I mean is the following thing. What Frank and Atem told us uh, 25 years ago, uh, where is it? It's here. They told us the following thing. They told us, when you renormalize the flow for the heat equation, you should not think, okay, you see a constant, it's a constant function, but you should think that this constant, it's a singular profile in some sense, it has infinite energy, it's a monster, right? It's very big. And in fact, they're telling you, but this is not the right picture. There's another scale at which you should think of this problem. And at this other scale, you, would see a, you will see a nice function. You will see exactly what you expect. You will see kappa divided by one plus you know, some z squared to some power. right? And you need to go to this scale, otherwise you don't see anything. So it's this idea that you renormalize with scanning, but you're not seeing the right, you're not seeing the right picture. The right picture is something that you know, there, there, there is an inner scale at which you need to compute things, and this is exactly what's happening in this uh, uh, in this defocusing de NLS and 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 compressible fluid problem. It's really this idea that there is an inner layer, and that it's the computation of the inner layer that will give uh, uh, it's the understanding of the inner layer that will allow you to understand uh, um, this kind of problem. In other words, you know, it's really these things on the heat equation that were done, you know, nearly 30 years ago now, that, you know, started, uh, you know, a very long program which eventually led, you know, in particular to this work on, 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 on Navier-Stokes. It's really this study of baby models, which maybe you could think are too simple. Maybe you should think maybe they don't contain you know, universal behavior. Well, in fact, they absolutely do. And they, they, they give you exactly the right intuition to address uh, more physical model. And, you know, it maybe took some time to convince everybody of that. But I think now the convention, uh, you know, everybody's convinced. I hope so. All right. So, Franck, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do I get out of here? Uh, let me, I don't, know, I don't know how I get back to my own. Uh, I, I know. So. So let's see. I just need to, yeah. So, so you see something here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Frank, exactly. So we've been collaborating for twenty-two years, <laughs> and we've seen this picture. I mean, this is this is this is a beautiful painting that was made by your wife. 
And you know, when I saw it, first of all, I was very impressed. And you know, I thought, well, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was my advisor, right? <laughs> you know, very concentrated, you know, very focused. You know, I I'll tell you a little secret. When I started my PhD with you, uh, I saw you one or, two twi one, one or twice in Sergi. And then at some point, and I only understood later that I was upgraded there, you told me, well, we have some work to do. So we won't go to Sergi. Let's meet in a cafe in, uh, in Paris. Let's go to the Fumois, and we'll have some work done. And uh, you know, I thought, uh, well, I mean, this guy is not very serious. I mean, he's giving me, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> supposed to have work in a cafe. You know, maybe my choice of advisor was not, uh, <laughs> 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 was not so good. I was not very happy with this. So I go to the Fumois. We work four hours non-stop in the Fumois. I got out of it. Well, I, you know, I was completely exhausted. And I'll tell you what I thought. Uh, you know, being myself a football fan, I thought, well, this guy is playing in Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> if I want to play in Premier League too, <laughs> I have to start working a lot. And which I did, I mean, uh, but, 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 you know. So of course, uh, you know, all these years, you know, collaboration, know, evolves, our, our relations evolve, but you know, from the very beginning, it's been, you know, you showed me a universe that you know, I had no idea existed. And, 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 and I think there's something very specific with Frank. It's something that, you know, is really very strong is that what Frank likes is to be in the wild, you know, uncharted te territory, no map, no book, no techniques, no nothing is going to help you. It's not the point. You know, this KDV work that they did with Yvonne, it's like being in a remote island, nobody's there, and, and you, have to, you, know, you have to survive. There was nothing, there was nothing to help them, and this is, this, is, this is what you taught me. You taught me how to go to the wild, uh, get lost, a lot, <laughs> because we get lost, like, a lot. Thanks. And, and I'm sure that I'm not the only one you got lost with. I'm sure that you, uh, you, you get lost mm, too much, Frank. <laughs> I can tell you now. But, but this, is, uh, this, was, um, this was a hell of a journey. So, of course, along the years, you know, we had tons of uh, opportunity to, to meet. My PhD was about cafes in Paris. And then you went to Chicago. Then many times we went to Chicago and we have some very intense uh, working session in Chicago. You remember Jim took a picture of what uh, of one of these very hard working session that we had to <laughs> together. So I think this was the beginning of the working session, and maybe this was the end of it. So <laughs> 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 I'm not sure which theorem we were thinking about on this one, but uh, it was. It's been yeah. It's been it's been very intense. I mean, this is the, this is exactly this. So we took a picture of your, of your collaborators. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Yoshi Matano is, is, is not here. So not all of them are there, but these are, these are the people that are here. So the, you know, they, they are all still here um, around you. And you know, uh, they certainly enjoy work. Thomas is missing? Thomas, 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 Thomas where? Thomas I'm sorry. Thomas. Where are you, Thomas? I'm sorry. So <laughs> we took the ones that were here. I mean, um, but anyway, you know, they are all here. Um, you see that many, many people answered our call when we, when we organized this conference for you. And, you know, I'd, I'd like all of you to join me, uh, you know, to congratulate Frank for all this work and wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Frank.